Uh, just want to remind everyone that the, uh, this workshop is being recorded. Uh, and also, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand, uh, put a question in chat. Both uh, myself and Dr. McKenzie will be monitoring that. Um, as, you, as you recall, many of you have attended some of these campus conversations in the past, but I do want to reiterate the purpose of the campus conversation. Uh, these conversations serve as a catalyst for change by bringing people together to learn, share experiences, ask questions, and inspire collective action. The series will be addressing race from many different perspectives, and we've done that throughout the uh, academic year. Through open and honest dial and civil dialogue, we can hear and learn from one another. And of course, we do not expect uh, that our, our racial issues will be uh, solved in one hour, but we, we do believe that we can begin paving the path forward. So I wanna thank each of you for being here and uh, being a part of this conversation. As our uh, facilitator for today uh, is a good friend of mine from Marshall University. We will leave the Marshall part off right now, you know. <laughs> but they're a good friend, a good partner in diversity at Marshall University and Ohio University working together with the Tri-State Diversity Conference. But uh, Dr. Shelby Campbell Monroe is the Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at Marshall University's Joan C. Edwards School of Medicine and School of Pharmacy. And I'll let her share uh, any additional information she uh, wants to with you, but Dr. Uh, Campbell Monroe, we're so glad to have you here and I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, and thank you so much, Robert, for that, that wonderful introduction. I can honestly say that Robert Pleasant is one of my most favorite people. He is so innovative, and you guys are just so fortunate to have him at Ohio University. And I know he's not paying me for that either. That's truly from the heart. So I just wanted to, to let you know that. Again, welcome. Um, and I think Robert has already mentioned that I am the uh, Diversity and Inclusion Associate Dean for the Schools of Medicine and Pharmacy at Marshall University. And so first, I want to thank you for taking time to, you know, listen today and especially um, you know thinking about some of the things that we will discuss today please know that um, the information that I am sharing is is just it will be a refresher for some for some it will be new but we can't cover it all within you know the one hour so I'll try to touch on you know the areas that I believe that are um, most important so let me pull first uh, my PowerPoint so that we can at least share that. Let's see, one second. Sorry guys, sometimes I'm good and today just may not be one of those days. <laughs> Here it comes. So when we talk a little bit about um, uh, implicit bias, it covers so many different areas. And so um, with implicit bias, we could definitely um, talk for, for weeks on end. Well, I can't find it now. Okay, hold on for a second. I'm still trying to locate my PowerPoint, forgive me. I'm pretty sure I had this. Can you all see that? No? Not yet, no. All right. Woo! Now you should be able to. Yes. Hey, we finally made it. Thank you. So today for our ground rules discussion, and usually when we're in person, there's many things that I try to set the ground rules for, and it's about being comfortable as we talk about things that sometimes will trigger emotions um, and other type feelings. And so today, our primary commitment is to learn one from each other. And so I encourage you to put, you know, your thoughts or any questions that you have in the chat. Um, we want to make sure that we don't demean, devalue, or put down anyone that speaks up about an experience or the lack thereof. And also for those who are sharing information, um, should we get to that point? We wanna make sure that we keep our, our personal things to ourselves at that point. Trust what we're doing as always, we're doing the best that we can. 
Um, you can challenge ideas, but not really the person. That's not a good thing to do. Um, speak up for your discomfort. And sometimes we have to step up and step back so that we don't offend anyone as we talk about these most important issues. So today's objectives, um, first is to, you know, talk a little bit about the insights on how our minds operate, how we understand bias and the origins thereof. Also uncovering some biases that we have that maybe we didn't think about and then learn some strategies for mitigating bias. And again, let me mention that we're not gonna get it all today. I mean, we could, we could talk about this for weeks and weeks. There's so much out there on uh, implicit bias. And I've been studying implicit bias for probably the last seven, eight years, starting with a week long implicit bias um, workshop. Um, it was an in-person workshop that was pretty intense. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we can't begin to talk about implicit bias without first talking about the big word bias. Bias is, um, you know, we can define it in so many different ways, but specifically, we know that bi we're biased, our biases fall. For instance, it means a strong inclination of our mind or preconceived opinions about something or someone. It could be favorable and or unfavorable, and it could serve to be a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, biases are there for a reason. We all have them. It doesn't mean that we are bad people. It doesn't mean that um, you know we're doing something wrong. It can be influenced by a number of factors, um, such as maybe a good example would be um, you're the owner of a newspaper and the newspaper could be biased towards a, a, a particular political party because the owner shares the beliefs of that same political party. So that's a good example of how, the, how bias can fit in. So we all have it. Biases, again, can be positive or negative. And we know that our brains are wired um, to recognize patterns, things that we do every day. We can look at sometimes, um, and I'm often, I'll send an email and I'll have transposed um, letters in it and then I'll email back and say, mm, forgive the typos, but the person could read it. They could normally read it because we're conditioned to, to pick out patterns and generalizations. And often our biases or our judgments and the decision-making in many situations um, can be sometimes healthy. We're, we're, we're walking down the street. We see uh, a lion that's coming towards us. What do we do? Cross the street. We know it's danger coming. So we can use those biases sometimes in a good way. But it's also possible to have a bias towards an object, uh, a person um, that's positive or negative. Bias in and of itself is really a neutral term. So there are times when biases can cause us to act in ways that undermine our personal goals or the things that we're doing. And I'll give some examples of that later on. Another good example would be these three colors. And I picked these three colors because they're pretty common, but I could say that I'm biased towards red. Red's my favorite color. Or I could say I'm biased against blue, or maybe I'm neutral towards yellow. So all of these statements could be true and I think most people would agree that my particular preference on red over yellow doesn't make me a bad person. It's simply my preference. And I probably didn't do anything to consciously control that being my preference. I like the color red. And so this is how I guess we, we wanna kind of think about where our biases fall, good or bad. So what is implicit bias? How do we define implicit bias? And, and why does it truly matter? And people say that to me, well, what does it matter? Well, implicit bias refers to our attitudes or our stereotypes. It affects our understanding of specific things, our actions and the decisions that we make in an unconscious manner. So when we discuss implicit bias today, we're really referring to the attitudes and the stereotypes that affect our understanding of our actions, our decisions and, and that in an unconscious manner. So I think to unpack that just a little bit more, implicit bias are attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding and actions, um, our decisions, biases that are activated involuntarily. It's without our control. We just do it because it's something common that we do and we work through. And it's not accessible through introspection. People who engage in this type of thinking are, they're not aware. 
and and a good example, I guess, of of intro uh, perspective is when you you um you media and you try to understand feelings, you're trying to look inward to find out why you're acting a certain way, um, or you're checking out your own thoughts and feelings, and in your mind you're trying to think about how why did I act that way? You're self reflecting. And so that's kind of what I mean when I talk a little bit about introspect, uh, introspection in regards to um, implicit bias. So the characteristics of implicit bias, it's robust and pervasive. Um, the associations don't necessarily mean that they align with our beliefs. Um, we generally hold our biases in favor of our own groups, the things that we do, the things that we're um, comfortable with. Um, implicit biases have real world effects on how we behave and they're malleable. So it means we can unlearn them. We can learn and we can unlearn. Implicit bias also refers to our attitudes or stereotypes. So by definition, um, implicit bias is nothing more than um, our evaluations or our beliefs, whether they're positive or whether they're negative and they exist without us knowing it. So they, they're hidden, they're kind of uh, in a spot where we we don't really know. And we're talking about this today because we know that it's possible for us to form um, implicit evaluations or biases based upon, you know, stereotypes, things that we've learned over time, um, objects, ideas, things that's just we've been hit with all of a sudden and it's fresh in our minds. So implicit bias, um, it's not a, it's not in our control. It's influenced by our backgrounds, our environment, and our experiences. Implicit bias, our thoughts and feelings are operating outside of our conscious awareness and control. So it's an automatic. And a lot of times I think about it as fight or flight. What am I supposed to do here? And so this is, is kind of the way I think that it's been explained through all of the research that I have reviewed over the last many years. The attitudes and stereotypes that affect an understanding of implicit bias, um, the actions and decisions, it causes us to have attitudes and feelings about others that we may don't know why we have them. Um, it could be a learned type um, uh, thing that we've, we've learned when we were very small and we are now moving that forward. And I'll give you a good example. I'm born and raised in West Virginia. And so I'm a West Virginia girl. And I say that all the time. I say I'm a coal mining kid because I grew up in um, a very small area that was at one time the heart of the billion dollar coal field. My grandmother was, was born and raised in Southern West Virginia. And she would make all these things from scratch. Um, chow chow, which for those of you who don't know, it's kind of a relish that we put in our beans and she would make that from scratch. She would make South me. Sometimes you see it in, in the store and it's listed as something else. And she would always call me to come down and help. And so it's my great grandmother. And so she would say, as soon as I walk in the door, Shelby, cause she never got my name right, bless her heart. She only graduated sixth grade. And she said, I need you to run in the back room and look on top of that chest of drawers. And I want you to pull down all the white pillowcases and bring them to me. Don't bring the color pillowcases because if you do, my chow chow will be sour. I was like, what does that mean? But until we were probably in maybe the third grade or so, uh, and we were doing vocabulary and learning words, I realized that she was saying Chester drawers. Well, we thought it was C-H-E-S-T-E-R drawers. And only then that we learned that it's chest of drawers. So there is a great example of how sometimes we learn specific things and we're exposed to specific messages and those messages may not always be true. So it, it is, again, your implicit bias. These are things that can be unlearned. Most notable implicit biases, I think, that, that cause us to make assumptions normally fall um, within the gender, um, within the race and ethnicity and those kinds of things. So our attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding and actions and decisions in a conscious manner. Um, so what does that mean? What exactly does that mean? It means that we are, um, we define implicit biases, those attitudes that affect how we move on a daily basis. And we bring bias to life many times when we are looking at things. And we'll, we'll have the opportunity to do that as we're inspecting things, as we're meeting people for the first time. And so with implicit bias, a study in 1995 by Greenwald and, and uh, Binya 
hypothesized that our social behaviors were not entirely under our conscious control. And that's really true. The study really talked about our hidden biases and it suggested that we learn the stereotypes, that we operate automatically, unconsciously, it's like autopilot. And so we think about, think about that when we interact with others. How many times have you met someone and before you meet them, they're walking up to you and you're, you're trying to chalk them up within the first two, three, they say seven, seven seconds. You're trying to make up your mind there. And we develop a quick attitude about that person. And then sometimes that makes an issue for us as we're trying to communicate with that person. We're thinking about all these things that may or may not be true instead of what's happening right there at hand. And I, I always talk about the diversity iceberg and about looking at a person beyond what you can see. Much of the implicit bias research has centered around, you know, um, you know how teachers are treating students within class, um, how we look at hiring practices, you know, how we do other things and decisions that we make, and how unconscious bias or in the implicit bias triggers specific things. There was a specific research on gender bias, and it was found that teachers. Uh, the primary reason that males, 19.3%, were more likely than females to take advanced math courses. And a lot of that has to do with the biases that, that sit with those who are, you know, training others. I hear it from some of the students that are in, you know, my, my summer pathway program. They say, you know, Dr. Campbell, I, I really went to the counselor to ask about taking the AP course, and she just told me I shouldn't take it. I, and I said, well, why? Why did she tell you that? Well, I don't know. I said, well, did you ask? Well, no, I just, you know, go by what she said. This person happened to be super smart. Now, um, getting ready to apply to med school. But she had to do a lot of back work to catch up because there was not someone there saying, you really need to take this AP course. And so it goes back again to the biases that we have can sometimes spill over into the things that we're doing. Racial bias, researchers at John Hopkins compare differences in educational outcomes uh, between white and black teachers and the things um, and what they had for their black students. And they found that the white teachers were 30% less likely to predict their black students would graduate and 40% less likely to predict that the black students would go on to college. Very, very interesting study. So I think I'm going to stop right there because there may be just a couple of questions that that I have thus far because I know I talk a little fast because I'm, I, want, I wanted to try to get through. I told Robert I had about I have 190 some odd slides because I do this as a workshop. So I had to try to pull them back in order to get to, you know, some specific points for you. But I wanted to stop there to see if we have any questions thus far. So one of the things I, I I wanted to make sure we had this conversation about implicit bias because there seems to be some confusion or that it gets confused what is unconscious bias and what is implicit bias. I mean, there seems to be that confusion. So will you talk, I mean, you mentioned it in your presentation, but would you highlight that a little bit more uh, so that we have a, make sure we all have an understanding of what, what that means? I absolutely will. And unconscious and implicit bias are kind of interchangeable because the, the unconscious, you know, is you don't know. And the implicit is also something that's not explicit. So it's not known. So I just don't come out and say, I don't like frogs. Frogs are out, not, not dealing with frogs. Or you, you kind of come back in and say, well, hmm, frogs. Well, I could think about it for a second. Why is it that I don't like frogs? So you, it's interchangeable, you're explicit and you're unconscious because those are things that you're really not processing, you're moving automatically. And so sometimes I interchange those. And I think when I first started studying, um, I started studying it from the unconscious bias side and then later the implicit came in as, as, as more of, I guess, the more correct word or, or word to use, but they're kind of interchangeable. And so when you say unconscious, it is an explicit and implicit bias. So it's something that you're, it's, you're not doing it purposely. It's not, it's not something that you're, it's, it, you're dead set on and you're moving forward with. It's something that you really don't know that you're doing or that you have. And so that's, that's a good question. Any others? Okay. Let's come back. I think I found it this time though without an issue. So with, at, I think we talked about the John Hopkins um, um, study. So implicit bias and, and lots of times people say, well, okay, 
you know, we have all of these different places within our brain that we're storing things, things that we ready recall. And so when I talk about implicit bias, I always have to bring out schemas because they're templates of knowledge, things that we have within our minds that we, we go to, we go to look for it. And with it, it is a conscious, more or less in action um, that we look for, that we're pushing for, that we're moving to so that we can decide where we're going to place things. We automatically categorize. We know we do it. It's something that we do for just about everything, not just people. And so once an individual has a specific thing in their minds, sometimes it's, it's activated no matter what. It's something that you've seen. It's something that's that's come along. And I think that's probably the best best explanation without going through a long line of when we talk about schemas. And schemas has a very good place where unconscious bias is concerned. For instance, and we talked a little bit a few minutes ago about implicit bias. Well, the explicit discrimination is a conscious action. Remember I said, I don't like frogs, boom, that was it. And schemas is a non-conscious expectation. It's more of a stereotype um, that's associated with specific things or specific groups. And it's things that we've done, um, you know, things that we've heard for years. And a great example of this is I have a very good friend. We do lots of things together. She is a shopper. She can find a bargain. I don't care if it's in California, right here from West Virginia. And so she often will come to me and she'll say, hey, I want you to come and look at this stuff. Look at all the stuff that I got. I, oh my goodness, I found this deal. And this, and I said, oh, that was very expensive. How much you pay for that? And she said, I jewed them down. I said, what? What did you say? And she said, well, I jewed them down. I said, okay, we need to stop right here because I want to know what you mean. Explain to me what you mean by that. Well, well, there was nobody there Jewish. Okay, so why did you say that? And then she said, you know, I've never thought about it. I mean, it's something, a word we've always used. We've always said it that way. And I says, but do you recognize when you say that what you're doing? And so here is a great example of what she has associated with over things that she's learned over time that she's never really thought about the effects that it would have on someone else should they hear it. And so we had a long conversation about it. And I gave her some things to read and we talked about some things and now she does and she'll say, nope, I got a great deal. And guess what I did? I talked them all the way down from here. So she no longer uses those same phrases. So when I think about, you know, we think about schemas, we think about often how things are just kind of there, things that we've learned over time and it is based upon, you know, um, something that was incorrect. So here, I'm pretty much saying that our schemas can be distorting and result in poor judgment. So just a poor judgment of what she said about her shopping experience. And so think about that in terms of how we're moving through the day and the stereotypes and things that play into um, what we do on a normal basis. Schemas are widely shared. And I think I talked a little bit about that already. Regardless of gender or race, um, uh, people have a, they have a threat. They get threatened sometimes based upon schemas that are associated with something that's super personal our race, our gender, we hold them all about, we hold them all about men, we hold them all about women. And I think about, you know, as my son back way back when you were growing up as if I grew up in the dark times, he, he always says, you know, mom, you way back when you grew up. Well, I think about it when I was growing up, I can only remember one person that was a doctor in my town and he was a dentist. So I think about the schemas and then whenever I do the implicit bias test and why it told me that I had a bias towards women in science. And so again, it goes back to the things that we have learned. We're not aware that we've learned them, but we're utilizing what we've learned to move through our day. And so I have here the implicit association test, which is the test that I really suggested. If you haven't taken it before, I, I suggest that you do it. Take some time and do it. Now, don't go and take the test take it, you didn't like it, take it again, you didn't like it. That's not what it's for. It's all about being honest with where you are, doing the test so that you can recognize where your biases fall. And there's so many, so many tests out there from Harvard, it's, it's, it's many. But you know, it, it's a breakdown towards the end so you find out a little bit about um, where you are in terms of your beliefs and then you can find out where your unconscious beliefs are. So again, going back to schemas, they play a, a significant role um, in our lives. And, and we think about it because we do, we, we're very busy during the day. 
We have so many things that we're doing um, on, a, on a timely basis. So we're quickly trying to find the answer so that we can move on. And sometimes when I think about schemas and they're used when in admissions for, for, our, for our medical school, when we hire people and so forth, we sometimes, because of this, the schemas and things that we experience, we have a hard time recruiting in, in individuals or bringing individuals in that have been underrepresented. And so how are we going to re reach our critical mass and hire more individuals who are diverse if we can't bring those individuals in? Or when we get them to apply, we don't reach out to bring them to us. And so I think about you know schemas and how the roles that it plays as I think about the things that I do on a daily basis. A research um, study talked about the evaluation of, of fellowship applications and the success rate of female scientists who were applying for fellowships. And so with this particular study, the women who applied for these fellowships had to be 2.5 times more productive to get the same rating as a male applicant. And so this I put out here because this definitely is in many of the studies of implicit bias. And you know it talks about how sometimes our biases roll over into things that we do. Similar findings I've, I've listed here. Um, so many different um, uh, studies have been done on this as, I, you know, as I've discussed. Gender schemas and recommendations for success, successful medical school faculty applicants. Um, these were some of the studies that, that have come out and I kind of pulled one or two from, from my, um, my PowerPoint, my, my huge PowerPoint. Men's letters are most, in most cases, were longer, more references and so forth and so on. And women's were more shorter, more personal um, references, more references to personal things in their life. And then they said more doubt raisers. So this was some things that happened, I think, within a search committee where um, they were kind of looking at how amazing it was that the differences in how they evaluated those applications. So in other words, they were saying things like, it's amazing how much she's accomplished. And it appears that her health is stable. She's very close to my wife, all these other things. They didn't do the same thing for the men, for the male applicants. And this is an example of gender, gender schemas. And then there's priming. So what is priming? It's, it's an unconscious form of memory. It's concerned with how we identify things, words, objects, um, how we move forward um, with associating things, whether we move across the street, as I mentioned for the line, or whether we, run right up to the lion. Um, and, and a good example also is a person that sees the, the word yellow. Are they going to be able to recognize the word banana as quickly? And it happens sometimes because there's an association between yellow and the banana. It's in your memory. And also techniques that you know they use in psychology to train a person's memory. It's both, both positive and negative, but these are where priming is concerned. And so there's several things when, when I talk about um, implicit bias, prim priming exercises. And these exercises are things that, you know, your mind is doing specific things. And, and, I, and then I'll tell people, say the word hot 10 times and, and then what do you do to green light? Or, you know, I tell people, you know, um, say the word white 10 times and then what's a cow drink? And so these are things sometimes, and people will start going hop, 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 hop. And then I'll ask the question and they'll say hop. Or I'll ask the next question, all of these things are priming exercises. And these are ways to think about how quickly we make decisions on things. And then of course, there's the Stroop effect, which is, I'm sure some of you have seen the Stroop effect. The Stroop effect is, it was found that the subjects took a lot longer to complete task, lost my glasses, okay. To complete task, naming the colors um, when the words in an experiment. And so this is, is one that I think I enjoy the most because I've done it. I mean, I've done it. And then I go back and say, oh, I did that wrong. I did that wrong. Let me try it again. Let me try it again. So he identified this particular effect as causing a delay in identifying a color when it was congruent with the word printed. And I'm sure you have seen this, this particular experiment. Again, a good example of how our minds work and, and things that, that we do that's consistent. Because we're unaware that we are imposing a uh, interpretation, specifically, generally unaware of our experience, and we're looking at this specific auditory effect. When you look at this, you look at the sizes and the shapes, and it looks like the monster in the back is huge chasing a small one, when in essence, they're the same size. So it's our perception of how we see things. 
the key information I think to remember is that our brains are, will continue to rely on our experiences. It's what we do. It's how we move through the day. It's how we, we think about fight or flight. It's how we think about attacking things. And so we have to understand that sometimes it's threading things together that may or may not or should be threaded together. And so we think about that or should think about that as we move through um, any decisions that we make and as we're working with individuals on a daily basis. An awareness of our implicit bias invites us to rethink how we approach our decision-making. And so I think for me, it's, it's, it takes some time to understand where or how to apply specific things where implicit bias or concern. It takes a little while for us to think about how to approach you know, specific things and how to make ourselves better. So I, I went very quickly through um, you know, a few things to talk a little bit about how we associate things and what we do um, as we are making our decisions on a daily basis. But when we think about implicit bias, how does it impact our work in our everyday life? What, you know, how does it impact us? And so with that, I think about the ladder of inference because the ladder of inference is a very important piece. This is sort of a, a skill set if you, you haven't seen it before. And it's more of a way to state that our beliefs affect um, what we select to move in our heads through our environment. So in other words, what are, we, what are we choosing to, what are we choosing to remember? What are we choosing um, to, to move forward? Sometimes as you, you think about this, we have something that we're, we're really trying to prove. And so I say, wow, I know for a fact that she had on red shoes. And, and I know she had those red shoes on and I'm sure of it. Um, I'm sure it was red and really those shoes were blue. So we think about the data that we remember Sometimes we're getting so much, we select certain information from information that, that came from an assumption of some sort. Or we believe that our beliefs are true based upon uh, an experience that we've had. And maybe in, in, in most cases, it was an individualized type um, experience. So I think when we think about the ladder of inference, we think about you know, our observations and then of course it leads to our actions. And the center of that are our assumptions. What exactly are we taking from that um, that's making us not think about our decision as we're moving forward? So let me stop there and ask if you have any questions thus far. I know I'm talking fast, I'm sorry. None? Shelby, one of the questions I've got, uh, and I think you've covered part of it, uh, from uh, we always invite in all the participants if they want to uh, um, give an observation or to ask a question. And one that I got from multiple uh, multiple people is, how can I uh, can I kindly correct my family when they openly give in to a stereotype? Now that's going to be something that we'll 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 cover later. But just to kind of give you a quick purview of that. It's, it's kind of hard to, um, to just, people feel attacked when you, when you say things to them like, well, I don't know why you said that and, and that, unless you're very close to that person. And so sometimes it's hard to mitigate that. And, and so often it is by giving examples, you know, by talking about storytelling, um, talking about things so that they can see things from a different angle. And, and lots of times it is the person has been conditioned in one specific way. And I think prior to as we began this, this, this um, discussion today, I've talked a little bit about a conversation I had with a gentleman regarding the Black Lives Matter. And so he talked a lot about as he was growing up that his, his family was pretty prejudiced and that he, you know, he learned later as he went on and he grew and he went to college and, you know, some things had changed, some things that he didn't, um, the things that he had learned had not necessarily been true. And one of those things that he mentioned, you know, was that black people are lazy. And then I laughed because I said, well, you know, we hear that all the time. He said, but then, you know, Dr. Campbell, I have known you now for the past two years. He said, and oh my goodness, you do like 50 million things. I was like, yep, so I debunked that myth, didn't I? And so we laughed a little bit about that, but I think too, it goes back to our, our experiences and it's about that open conversation and someone willing to learn. 
And so it's it's more or less debunking that myth. Sometimes you can talk to your, you know, a whole different um, color in your face and you still don't get your point across. And so it is, it's, it's something that has to be, um, they have to be open to learn and want to know and understand that times and things have changed and, and we have evolved and things are just a little bit different. And so we'll, we'll have a, a couple of slides that'll talk a little bit about that. And I'll touch, touch bases on that as we move forward. Let me see, back to the letter, the ladder. So let's see if I can get this going. So what do you see first here? I know you've seen this picture before. See, I, I first looked at it, the very first thing I saw was an elderly woman. I was like, oh my goodness, it looks like an, um, oh. Then I kept looking, I was like, it looks like it's changing. And then you see a young lady. And so this, I usually put out there um, because again, this is again, our perception so that people understand, what do you see first is my question. And the reason I ask that is we're sizing this up as soon as we look at it, I start looking, oh, wait a minute, it's an elderly person. Oh no, it's a young person. Hmm. Then other things start floating through my mind. This is what we do. This is part of our, our, our stereotypes, our unconscious bias as we're sizing people up. First impressions, do we size people up? Yes, we do, in about seven seconds. And during that time, we're using all of these things, these learned behaviors, all of these other things that have hit us over time. And we're using that to evaluate that person right there. So I show this picture often. And I say, hi, my name is Monica Sony. I say, what'd you think when you first saw that picture? And in a workshop, we talk about it. We talk about it. I actually have a very good friend whose name is Monica Sani at the University of North Carolina. And she is Asian. And we laugh when we talk and I, I sent her this and I said, look, here's your twin. And we, we talked about that. And so she says, oh my goodness, we've got to talk a little bit more. But think about how often we size individuals up based on just how they look. At least half of the exercise I get every day comes from jumping to conclusions. We do it, we jump to conclusions. And a lot of that has to do with our biases and our implicit biases. So who are we? I mean, who are we? We're people with different backgrounds. We're people with different cultural experiences. We come from different places. We participate in different things. We're full of differences, human differences, similarities. Um, characteristics, and I always never lose the opportunity to put the diversity wheel out there because that's what I do on a normal basis. But when I think about, you know, how, who we are, I think about all of these things. We're also very different, yet we're alike. And so in this, when you think about implicit bias, think about how often we, we, we take all of these things that we learned over time and we form our opinion without knowing the entire thing. So, I loved High Mark, West Virginia, because I have a very good friend, Dr. Johnson, who visits me whenever she's in the area. And I said, I want that slide, and she sent it to me. Our change in demographics, 2050, it says, this is what our demographics will look like. In 2000, this is what our demographics look like. And in 2000, 2100, move it up so I can see, our demographics change, whoops, quite a bit. And so I, I show this slide to think about, we have so many rich backgrounds and cultures and, and people from different places. How is it that we often end up with our implicit biases? Why is that? Again, it goes back to our learned behavior and things that we learned over time. How does implicit bias work in everyday life? For the homeless. How many times have you walked by someone asking for um, change and then you you formulated something in your mind and you're saying all these things as you're walking down the street in your mind or to someone else. How does that work? Well, I think about this with with implicit bias. I I, I often have to I have to think about putting myself in another person's shoes, empathy, um, the path for that person, I'm sure was different from mine. And these are things that, that you have to think about. But again, it's not something that you can, you can do to mitigate those overnight. I think about implicit bias work in everyday life in media and in criminality. And I turned on um, uh, for the news the other day, and I think it was Massachusetts. It was a mother and father talking about their six-year-old was um, expelled from school and reported 
because of um, some type of sexual misconduct. Six years old. Now, the young man, his mom is, is um, I don't know what nationality, is. his dad's a black man. And his dad actually came on TV and said, you know, I, um, I really believe that there needs to be additional training to, for them to understand this is a six-year-old. He hasn't learned, he doesn't know anything about anything when it comes to, you know, sex. We've talked about um, him with specific things, you know, inappropriate, you know, hugging and all these other things, but he's a six-year-old. So why is it? So in this particular picture at the top, it says a young man was walking through a deep flood water, you know, after looting a grocery store. Well, how do we know that this young man was not trying to save his stuff in a trash bag as he got out of the way of the water? Or, you know, the next one, two residents wade through water after finding bread they stole. Well, how do you know they didn't just bring that bread from their house? These are sometimes the implicit biases that work. And then media and others push it forward. And so I think about that for all the things that's happened over the last eight years, how media has played heavily into, um, sometimes in a negative fashion. And then, of course, the last one. Now, I don't know. He, he's jumping out there. So that might not be so implicit. But we don't know. We don't know. And so, I, I, again, it goes back to our assumptions, our stereotypes, and our beliefs. So how does it work in everyday life with the loss of innocence of children and criminality? And I talked a little bit about that, dehumanizing Black children, the consequences of, and there's so many studies out there on, um, you know, children and, you know, how they are conditioned very early on with, you know, to think about race and differences and, and those kinds of things. And it brings back to me um, a memory on uh, a short um, vignette that I remember seeing about uh, a young two children like they were in a study and they were walking looking at a film of children walking down the hall and one little girl who is black drops a dollar and a black girl's walking behind her and it just shows that caption and they asked the child what they thought and the child said well she saw the money uh, fall so she's going to give the money back they flipped it to have the white girl walking down the hall drop the money and the black girl walking behind her and the black little black girl said well I don't know I think she's going to steal the money why is that? And so again, it goes back to the conditioning of um, our children, okay? The loss of innocence of our children. How does it work from the school to prison pipeline? This one, because I you know, I often sit on the ACES, in the ACES meetings for the Ad adverse child um, uh, meetings. And it talks, you know, they talk a lot about this, you know, children being, you know, disciplined within the classroom and they're put out of the classroom, more so children of color. And so what that does for them, there's kind of a connection, putting them out of the classroom, they're not learning. The angriness that falls behind that and other things as they move through life, eventually prison pipeline. And so this is a, you know, a very good example of how our unconscious bias works from the school to prison pipeline. So in hiring, I think I, I took you through a couple of slides that talked about the study, the Chicago resume study. There's other studies that are out there. Um, you know, and in those studies, they talked about, you know, within their search committees, you know, well, it's not a good fit for our, for our company. It's, you know, the culture or the applicant pool wasn't very diverse. There's biases in social media. Um, there's biases with overweight and obese applicants and employees. And I remember we did a similar training for our medical students um, during the first year. And we found that many of them had a bias toward overweight people. Definitely not a place in healthcare. And so that's something else we had to work with. Um, there's other things for criminal records, um, poor credit histories. There's other things that affect um, those with disabilities, both visible and visible, and those who identify um, as LGBTQI there are implicit bias things that happen um, to prevent the hiring of individuals who may not identify or as they said, or I say here, not a good fit. To me, that's just an underlying saying whether or not they're not the same as us. So let's go to strategies and tips to combat imp implicit bias. So implicit bias, we know everyone has it. I mean, it's often incompatible with our cultures, our, our conscious values. As I mentioned before, when I did the IET test, I found that I had a bias um, towards men in science. Why is that? Why was that? And that, 
you know, I took that many years ago. Hopefully I haven't gone back to take it in a couple of years, but it, it really made me think about why, why I felt that way. And I thought, I don't really feel that way, but deep down somewhere I did. And it all had to do with the conditioning of my not seeing um, probably many um, scientists as I was growing up. But the flip of that is my mother was an RN. And so I knew about many other things and I could see, foresee a woman being a nurse, but why couldn't I think about it outside of that? So there's other things that fit with that, but that was a very good example. To break the cycle of becoming, um, you have to become more mindful, more mindful. And I put this statement out there because you know it basically talks about people are able to focus on different things and that we learn things, we can unlearn them. That, that's really all this really is referring to. We can unlearn specific things. So if we have a negative stereotype about something in spe specific, we can change that negative stereotype with, ed with being educated. Um, we can learn from others. And I think that's probably the other thing to say. Debiasing techniques. And you're not supposed to be, feel guilty about your biases. There, we, everybody has it. And when you, when you feel guilty about it, it's sort of like, well, that's not me. And then you don't do anything. So you have to kind of open your mind to know that you can learn something new on a daily basis. And you have to continue to go back and check yourself. I do it every day. I will say something, leave, and 10 minutes later, I will walk back and say, you know what? Let me apologize to you. I know I said this and I didn't mean it that way. And you know, I find that nine times out of 10, the person was like, what? I don't even know what you mean. They didn't catch it, but I did, which means that I know that I'm working on something that I need to. Training, continuous. We can't just do a one and done. Like this one hour will never get you there. It'll never get you there. You have to be continual. You have to be can. Well, I say deliberate, and you have to continually work on yourself. Um, Intergroup contact, working on in, working with individuals who are different from you. You know, working in groups, volunteering. Um, you know, going to a different um, worship community. I've gone to several and was amazed at you know the differences in doctrines, doctrines and other things within churches. And so I, I did that to kind of get a perspective when, when I was looking to for a new church. Taking the perspective of, of others. And I think I talked about empathy. Sometimes you have to put yourself in another person's shoes. Step back, step back and just think about it. Um, your, your body language. I talk with my hands. My husband said, I never noticed you talk so much with your hands. And I do. But, you know, I have to think about your body language can turn someone off. You know, our implicit bias, you know, a person can take it as something different. You're shrugging your shoulders, I don't care. Or we all walk into a room and we do this. So it's sort of like, well, what do you want? It is, you have to think about your, your expression there. And then think about those that don't fit the stereotype. We have to think about that as well. So let's practice for a minute. I want everybody to close their eyes. And I want you to think about a person riding a bike. Now, what image came to mind? Can you describe the person that was riding the bike? And we were in, usually we're in small group, we talk about this. Can you, can you think about where you saw that person riding the bike? Now, I'm not going to ask you to share, but I know that often, whenever I'm riding or I'm thinking about this. And the first time that I did it, I could only see myself riding that bicycle. And then I thought, wow, why didn't I put somebody else on that bicycle? And I, I say this because it's, it's more of thinking about, it's, you know, more of a debiasing technique. So you're, you're thinking about the individuals that you, you work with on a daily basis. And if that person that you saw riding a bike was different from you, then that's good because you're thinking outside of the box. Further reading, things that I think should be incorporated into your reading, and especially with bias, practicing what you've learned. You can introduce them to your, um, your family circles. Um, these are really good. And I actually talked a little bit about some things that came from The Blind Spot. It's a great book. And I've read it so many times because it really breaks down the IET. There's also The State of Science, the Implicit Bias Review. 
And then the everyday bias, Howard Ross. Howard Ross, we brought to speak at the very first Tri-State Diversity Conference. He, he's an awesome speaker and he's done lots of work in implicit bias. And I actually attended his implicit bias lab for the one week intense, very, very intense. And it really put me in touch with one who I was and then what I needed to do to mitigate, you know, some biases that I had about specific things. And so it then sent me on a whirlwind. I just started reading everything that I could get my hands on with regards to a book that I don't have up here that I, I've read several times and he really breaks down things mathematically. It's called The Difference by Scott E. Page. This is another good book for further reading to help open your mind to you know, how we deal with our implicit biases and so forth. Other tips to fight bias in, you know, in your home and circle is, you know, when you see something or you hear something that isn't right, and I talked about the story with my friend, talk about it. Stand up for it. Talk about it. Say why it's right, why it's wrong. And you can agree to disagree. Make sure it's a comfortable space. Make sure you, you know, pick your battles. You may not want to, you know, pick it with Robert if you're not good friends with Robert, but you guys may be able to talk about it if you have that question. And so it takes, it takes time for you to you know, to think about it. And we have to discuss it in order to work through it. And so in order to do that, you know, you have to know a little bit about, you know, where your biases fall. You have to be honest about that so that you can work on them. When you address them, it enables you to value your differences. It enables you to, you know, acknowledge other cultures. You can look at the strengths and, and focus on the strengths and, and recognize the importance context of others' lives. And so we know that we, again, are more alike than we are different. We have to think about, for me, I'm always thinking about equality and equity. And so this was a great example of that. The first picture, it, it looks as if everybody was benefiting from the same thing. And the second picture, it looks like it's, um, you know, they're trying to give them equal access, but then you took down all of the things that were in the way. And all of those individuals can now see the game without any barrier. That's kind of where we are when we talk about implicit bias. Engage in self or team affirmation. Find ways to think about those who are different, those who are similar, find common denominators, and remove whenever possible bias, bias information. And so it's something that I made a suggestion for um, our admissions team, and we do some of that. And I think it makes a difference. Even though we think it doesn't, it really does. Reflection questions. Your cultural background will impact how you interact with others. Positive impl implications means that it could influence your background, contribute to your role. What negative imp imp implications might exist? Do you work with diverse groups? If you do, what, what have you done to become more competent? What have you done to learn more about those specific groups? Names of groups or people against whom you were taught biases. Think about that, sit down and do it one day. And then think about what you've done to rectify that or what you've read or and what have you learned that, that really, you know, it really debunks the myth or the bias. And what steps will you take to ensure that you have a commitment to becoming culturally competent, learning more about biases and implicit bias? Think about what you've learned today. Think about the actions and things that you can do, things that you can bring back to your personal life and to your school to, to show um, that you've learned something about implicit biases. But, but you, of course, need to be aware of your own. And if you are, then you're better. You can talk about it better. You can discuss it. And you can bring that information back to your family. The more that you know, the more that you can share. And I think that when people see that you really and truly have an interest and you've really gone you know out of your way to learn a bit a little bit more about it and in most cases they want to hear about it you know you can share that and so that kind of addresses the question from you know about your family members some you'll never be able to get past that and you know I, as i mentioned growing up in southern west virginia i can remember when i was growing up um there were many many um interracial couples in my small town but then it seemed like as, as the years went on, it was such a big thing. I was like, well, why is that a big thing? Because we were conditioned to it. We saw it all the time. But then I, I would later learn of some of the trials and tribulations that those couples had when they were growing up and how maybe the, the mother or uh, the father was not accepted by you know, the, the parents because of that. And then as time went on and they saw that 
the relationship work and that what a great couple they made and you know how the the male or the female provided good for the family then it was a whole it was a change in the way that they looked at things and so I look at all of those things on a daily basis and changes in the community because I think I'm sometimes I go a little overboard but it's something that I do that's kind of actionable to make sure that I am continually learning and I'm trying to evolve. So being aware of my own biases makes me better. And, and it also makes me better when I communicate and I work with other individuals. You have to examine your behavior. We make automatic choices. We do it because it's there. And the second is to look at how our brain is activated. What are we doing to make us act in that manner? And I think behavioral assessments are the best tools. I mean, they give you the information that you can go back and review and then decide what you need to do in order to um, make or you have to make you better or even to think about um, how to mitigate your biases or your, your implicit biases. And so with that, I'll stop. But not without, not without putting out this last quote from Maya Angelou, I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. And so I wanted to make sure to share that with you so that you would you know, leave you with a nice ending um, quote for the day. Please know again that this was a very quick overview um, of, of a, from a workshop of implicit advice. It's so many things that are involved there, but I tried to touch on um, some things that I think would leave you with food for thought um, and hopefully give you a thirst to, to go out there and find some additional things you know, to make you better. Um, really, it's, if you don't have an open mind um, and you're a person that likes to change things, you'll never do it because you have to have an open mind in order to make change. And so I think that that's something that I kind of, it's, it's here every day that I think about when I'm really being very stubborn about listening to something that's new. And I'm like, mm, if you don't have an open mind, how are you going to change it? So I back up and I listen. And so I leave you with that note. Sometimes you have to take that extra time and, and you have to take that extra energy to continue to educate yourself so that you, um, you, know, you can be more mindful and more open and inclusive. And um, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. And I'm open for questions. Any questions or even comments that anyone has? This is great, great information. I just had one comment that it can be implicit or explicit, but the pie chart is, in its in it in itself is um, biased because you know a lot of Middle Easterners don't consider themselves Asian, you know, or, or biracial. Like where do I fall on that pie chart? So um, there's even stuff like that, like the senses that we have to pay attention to to, to create that change as well, um, or our different way of thinking. So that just immediately came to mind. No, that's a very good point. And I think about this. We know that, you know, the government is responsible for those categories way back when they were trying to, to decide who was considered um, white and who was considered eligible to vote. And so that that's kind of, you know, how those things happen. You know, and I, I say that often when we look at, you know, our numbers for the census, when we see the category that has multi races, that can mean almost any and everything. And so it is true that we often it is it has been set up that way, you know, from the beginning um, in terms of separating us, you know, by race, you have to pick a place where you want to be. And so I think that, you know, students often will, will say that, well, you know, you know, they, they're trying to figure out how to answer that question. Maybe their their mom is, you know, from um, uh, India and their father is from Pakistan, or they're, you know, and they're trying to figure out where do I put that in there? And so I, I actually had this conversation last week with one of our BS to MD applicants. And, you know, she said, you know, what was interesting is I came here when I was three years old and uh, it was just very hard for me being a brown girl. And that, I was like, oh, very interesting. You know, I've never heard, you know, anybody say that before. And she said, you know, and it took me a little time to integrate, you know, as I grew into the community. And so you're very true. Lots of things will, uh, unfortunately, we will look at those and we'll say, wow, that was an implicit bias. Um, and, and just to kind of give you a last good example, I went to lunch with, you know, pre-COVID with one of my good colleagues from, um, from the School of Medicine. And so we went into um, uh, a restaurant, downtown Huntington. And so 
she came over to the table and took our, our order. And so when she came back, she brought back silverware. And he, he looked at me and he said, well, that's a bias. I said, a bias? He said, well, an implicit bias. I said, well, why? He said, I like chopsticks. Why didn't she give me the chopstick? Then I said, oh my goodness, you listened to me. And we laughed about that for a little while. But again, it goes back to sometimes our, you know, our beliefs, the things that we've had over time. She probably walked to many tables and put the chopsticks down and said, I don't want that, I want a fork. So again, it goes back to that. But you're correct. There are many types of, of I think, implicit and biases that are there that we don't recognize. Um, and, and others don't recognize that they're there either. So that's where conversation comes in and why we have to continually educate ourselves there. But great comment. Thank you. I also want to commend the students um, and all those who've asked the question, if my family is believes a certain way, how do I handle that? Um, I just want to reiterate that you have folks on this campus, you're looking at a bunch of them now, that if you need to have a conversation with someone, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, come see one of us. Also, uh, Dr. Campbell uh, Monroe, um, I will make sure that we have her email uh, that we'll put that in the chat. Uh, so that if you want to get a follow up, any kind of follow up questions for her. Um, but I think, I think you said it right, Shelby, though, that there are some people that we cannot, that will not um, be open to this, but we have a responsibility to say something. I think it's important for us to say something to, to whoever it may be. So um, I, I just, I, I, I admire the strength in our students and our faculty and staff for standing up for what's right, so. Well, I can tell you this, this is the new generation of our newest generation of students. They're, they're super sharp. I mean, they get it. And I think that <laughs> we are the ones that have to come, you know, have to catch up because they're a little bit more progressive than we are. And so I, you know, I say that because I'm over back here in the, you know, over here on this side, you know, but it, it is true. I, I, I do um, I admire uh, and appreciate um, our students now. Um, they're in the innovative thought process and the things that they're doing is great. So it's really good that they did come out and ask those questions. Often when we're doing these types of, of discussions, people are just a little bit shy about talking about specific things. And so it's good that they were able to send questions. Absolutely. Any final thoughts from anyone? Okay. Okay. Dr. Campbell Monroe, thank you so much. This was very interesting. It's what we needed. And uh, um, we'll have you back sometime. We'll have you back. I, think it was I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you all for your, um, uh, for joining and for your kind uh, welcome. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.